good morning to Dr. Lay. So we're gonna do a, so I'm gonna do an interview with him today. But before that, uh, just a disclaimer: everything will be recorded, and uh, my lecture will have access to this uh, video. Um, video. So we'll proceed. Okay, first, uh, introduce yourself first. Okay. Uh, uh, good morning, Zara. Uh, I'm Dr. Clarence Lay. I am a medical doctor. I'm a urologist, uh, working mostly in Malaysia, and uh, I'm based in the hospitals in Kuching, including in the private, the government and the university. Um, and most of my life actually is is uh, involving the care, the medical care of urology patients. Okay. All right. So, um, do you think you are in good shape in terms of a healthy lifestyle now? I would like to think so. Uh, of course, healthy healthy lifestyle in both mental and physical health, la, You know, uh, and then the the physical health, of course, in both uh, your diet. Uh, you must take a diet that is balanced, and also to, to drink enough water, and the mental health, of course, you to keep your brain active uh, as well. Right. So moving on to the next one, how do your cognitive ability change as you age, and how do you adapt to your career and lifestyle choices accordingly? Well, as we grow older, uh, I think our memory sometimes is not as good. Uh, so and of course, in, in my career, I need to remember a lot of facts about uh, diseases, about patients. So so what I do is that I I take notes. I take notes and then later on I computerize them, put them into my computer, uh, so that I, I have I can refer back whenever I have uh, I have to, I meet with the same patient or the same condition. Okay, that's a good one. So, how did you enhance your cognitive development to improve your career prospect? Yeah, that's what I mentioned earlier. Re record keeping and documentation is is very important. Uh, and I try, I try very hard to remember my patient's name. I save them on my phone, so that when I see a patient, when somebody call me, I will remember. So I will see the the ID of the caller. Uh, and of course, you must. I have to keep reading. Like keep reading, uh, listen, see videos. Uh, and so we mustn't leave, allow our mind to go idle, like, you know, idle. So so you have to keep your mind active. Of course, must keep the body healthy, like, so that uh, our cognitive. Deterioration as we age uh, will be as slow as possible, but I think it's inevitable to have some cognitive deterioration as we grow older. All right. So, in terms of psychosocial, what are some psychosocial challenges that you face in your career, and how can they be overcome? Uh, you know, when we interact with human beings, it's inevitable. That we, we have uh, some psychological interaction, uh, and uh, as a doctor, of course, patients want to know more about the condition, and some a, a natural psychological reaction is that I'm being challenged. I'm a doctor. You are the patient. I'm being challenged. But but we have to have a change of mindset that patient, doctors, and students, teachers, we actually on the same level. We should be able to talk to each other, and when a patient or a, a doctor, a student asks me a question, I, I I take it as an honest question and I answer them. So I think if you are transparent, you are honest. Uh, I think I think most of the problems uh, can be resolved. The misunderstanding can be resolved. Of course, there there will always be people who are happy with each other. Hmm. So. With that being said, how did you separate your personal life from your work? Uh, basically, I think it's a. Uh, of course, if, if your personal life is affected too much by your work, then uh, things will go wrong. Uh, so you have to have boundaries, uh, boundaries and compartmentalization of your personal life and your work. For example, I have a phone. This is for my personal life, with the the close friends, doctors, family members, and I have another phone where I keep patients, students. Handphone numbers, their data, their medical reports, uh, and and uh, and, uh, and of course, after a certain time, or if I'm on leave, I I turn my 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 professional phone to silent, or I I divert it to another 
partner or my medical staff to look after my professional work because patients can fall sick anytime. Uh, so that's how I compartmentalize the thing. And of course, uh, my personal address and where I stay is, is personal. So that doesn't get get exposed. Uh, exposed to the public. So I think it's important to, to have enough physical physical mental rest uh, from your work. Uh, I think that's basically how, how I how I I compartmentalize and separate as much as possible the personal life from work. Of course, uh, some of the things are in public domain, not that they, whether I'm married or how many children I have, of course, mm -hmm. that, that is, that is uh, quite sometimes the public information, and which is also good, uh, which is also good to the public to, to know that you are, you are married you know, and you have children and so that they can empathize with you when you talk to them. All right. Um, since you're a medical doctor yourself, how do you maintain your health and vitality as you age? And did it impact your career prospect? And what are the common challenges that you face? Yeah, uh, to, to be able to function uh, in our career, you have to maintain your physical and mental health. Uh, physical health, as I said earlier, is important. Uh, exercise, you should try to exercise every day. And I think a very good exercise is to walk, a brisk walk half an hour every day. And preferably be to be exposed to sunlight and not to be in, sitting in the office every day because sunlight will stimulate the body uh, to balance the hormones. Um, and, and also you, you have to look after your bodily functions, like you drink enough water, pass urine every two hourly, open your bowels every day. And of course your diet should have enough fluids, your diet should have enough fruits, vegetables, uh, to have sufficient protein. Uh, either vegetable protein or, or animal protein and we know that uh, as we grow older our arteries become hardened and one of the risk factors is to take too much of animal fat you know, when you've got a high cholesterol and also your body weight must be op optimal because if you're too heavy then you affect your joints uh, causing causing difficulty in walking and you also try to maintain your hearing and eyesight so don't abuse the hearing by listening to too loud music because as you grow older you get mm -hmm. deaf and also protect your eyes from bright sunlight so if you're driving in bright sunlight you have to wear uh, sunglasses to protect your retina from uh, UV light uh, so these are some of the advice you can give for maintaining a good physical and uh, uh, physical health mental health you have, to, you have to keep active you have to be positive uh, and to be happy as much as you can uh, and to look to the future instead of brooding on the past so, what are your top five personal value that you that guide you throughout your daily life? Yeah, Zara, you asked me that earlier, so I thought about it because <laughs> five is quite a huge number. <laughs> so I, I I rank them in terms of importance. First, you must be courteous to people, whoever they are, uh, even people you don't like. Uh, okay, you, you have to be courteous to to everybody, to even to courteous to animals. You know, uh, two. Integrity is very important. If you lose integrity, there's no point talking about your ability. You know, you might be the best doctor in the world, but if you, if you don't have integrity, then people will not uh, respect you. Number three is compassion. To be compassionate to fellow human beings. It's different from sympathy. Sympathy means, oh, I, I understand you got pain, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no. But the other thing is, it's also different from empathy. Empathy means, you put yourself into somebody else's shoes and think, oh, I've got this cancer, how do I feel? Compassion means you actually do something about it. You know, you, you, you sympathize, you empathize, and you do some practical action, practical advice, or even, like for example, the patient cannot walk well, you actually hold the patient's hand and help him, to, help him or her to walk. The fourth is honesty. I think honesty is very important. Eventually, you have to be 100% honest, but you cannot be 100% honest all the time. For example, if the patient has got a very advanced cancer and you tell the patient that, oh, on the average, this kind of cancer only have a lifespan of three months. That's not really going to help the patient very much immediately. But of course, eventually, this information have to go to the family first and then, of course, gradually to the patient. So honesty is very important. Uh, and nowadays, of course, we talk about end of life uh, planning, you know. If somebody knows that he's going to die, there are things that he or she may want to do. Uh, so that, that honestly, but I have to filter down slowly. And, and finally, I think an important personal value is that we should try to aim to bring happiness uh, to fellow human beings, uh, to fellow living things, uh, happy, bring happiness 
to people as much as you can. Okay. Mm. How do you define self value, and why is it important for personal and professional development? Yeah, uh, I think the concept of self value is uh, is people tend to think that I am the greatest. I can do this. I can do that. But I think it's more important to be humble. To be humble. Uh, of course, you know what you can do, uh, but don't go beyond it. Uh, so, so, so if if you if you go beyond it, then you have high expectations on yourself. Or you think, okay, this year I can earn one million. Then you fall short. Then you feel upset. So, so you must be humble and start slow. Don't have too high expectations of yourself, uh, and also don't give high expectations to your colleagues. Uh, so I think I think that's important. The most important self value is that to be humble, but at the same time continue uh, working and also continue learning. Continue learning all the time. So the most uh, crucial question here is, what makes you you? Well, if I sit back and say, who is this Dr. Clarence Lane? Well, I would think I would like to think that I am basically a happy, healthy person, and I'm willing to share my happiness, uh, especially on uh, medical matters, in particular urology, uh, and also happy to share whatever I know uh, with my colleagues. Uh, and with the with the with students who want to come and and learn from me, so happy healthy healthy person sharing whatever I know with uh, with my with my colleagues. Uh, that's basically uh, basically my my, uh, my 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 thinking about myself, my identity as a happy healthy person willing to share. Okay, so with that said, what's your view on how? One's self identity can affect their personal and professional life. So, so with that kind of self identity, uh, when I, when I when I impact with my 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 my, my personal friends, uh, I don't have the idea of self gain. So, in other words, if I talk to you, I discuss with you, we go for a drink together, I'm not thinking of self gain all the time. So, so, so that, so that, that, that uh, we are on the level playing ground, you know, we don't have any suspicion that he's talking to me because he wants this, he wants that. And of course, when you talk to patients, uh, in terms of professional professionalism, uh, we only think of the patient's benefit, how I can help, help him. Uh, and also with my fellow colleagues, it's, it's a matter of how I can help them with their uh, patient's care, for example. So, 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 so this kind of self identity, I think, uh, I think is is to me is good, lah. Mm. Mm. Right. Moving on to the next one. So, in terms of relationship, how are your personal views on relationship, and how have they evolved over time? Yeah, I think relationship in life is very important because no man is an island. Um, so let me think about it. So. When we are born, we have our parents. Uh, of course, so we always have to respect our parents, irrespective of whatever, uh, whether they give us money or not, we have to look after them in their old age. I think that's a very important Asian concept. Then, of course, we have our siblings. Uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are born from the same blood, we came from the same womb. So, whatever differences, uh, we we have to confront it and uh, we have to share. We have to continue sharing with our siblings for the rest of our life. Of course, that is a bit different from the in-laws, I know, because the siblings uh, spouse may have may come from a different origin. And then that on when we get married, if we do get married, then the wife, your partner, the wife will be your partner will be very important. Uh, so she becomes he or she becomes the first priority in your life. Uh, in terms of your time, in terms of health, in terms of uh, uh, physical health, mental health. And then of course, if, if you have a spouse, and if you, you have children, then your children becomes your responsibility. Uh, as my children, my, my, one of my sons tell me, they did not ask to be born. So, so we have children, then we look after the children for as long as possible, I think in the Western culture, until the age of 21. There's the magic figure of 21. After 21, they're supposed to be able to look after yourself. But I know as a parent, and especially like in in a, in a country like Malaysia, in the same house we can have people who are Muslims and non-Muslims or or whatever you know. So 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 for example, I'm the chairman of the uh, radiology meeting in in Norma every Wednesday. 
lunchtime. So during the fasting month, we will not serve food in the conference room. So those who are not fasting, they can have the food in the uh, separate area, for example, in the cafeteria. And those who are fasting, they can tap out the food and bring home. So I think, I think mutual respect and agreeing to disagree uh, is an important, an important aspect of how we handle differences, which is bound to occur. So, 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 so we don't interfere in each other's uh, uh, sort of uh, area of life. No? We should continue to allow people to do what they want to do. So some, for example, some of my colleagues, they must go home at 4.15. So I try not to give them work at 4 o'clock because I respect, I respect that, that wish of them because they may have some other things to do. Say, so for example, uh, some, of, some of my lecturers, they have to leave at 4.15 to pick up the children from, from the nursery or whatever. So we, we, it doesn't mean they're not interested in the work. They are very interested in the work, but they have some other priorities in life. So we must learn to respect other people's opinion and other people's priority. And you can set your own priorities, which may be in conflict at first, but if you separate it, you, you, you redesign your life, then you can fit in uh, to the situation. And also we must remember that there are some things in life we cannot change. We cannot change. So we must, we must know which of the things we cannot change so that uh, we can have a, a, a suitable coexistence, especially in a country like Malaysia where we have so many races, so many beliefs. Okay? Right. Since medicine is a lifelong journey, what motivated you to pursue medicine as a career? Okay, it, it may sound like a very simple story. I decided to be a doctor when I was in uh, secondary school, Form 3. Uh, at that time, the immediate, the immediate event was I brought my mother to the local hospital for treatment. She had, she had bleeding from the nose and the doctor, who is an expatriate, immediately prescribed injection penicillin for 10 days. And after a few doses, you know in those days they actually boil the needle and inject uh, the penicillin. Of course penicillin is, is a painful injection. So my, my mother cannot cannot take the injection after a few doses. Uh, and actually eventually it turned out that another doctor diagnosed she has uh, no, nose cancer. Nose cancer. Then I look around me, well, I think that the, the people where I stay, I stay, I stay, have very poor medical care and thought, why not I take it up? It seems like I can I can I can I can study well. So that's when I decided that I want to be a doctor and nothing else, just be a doctor. So although I got scholarships to become an engineer, to become a, a pilot, I, I decided to take up medicine and that's how I, I started. It's, it's a it, it is a real story, like real story. Of course different people take up medicine for for different reasons, I know, for different reasons. And I, I, I see as it is, I think I turned out to be turned out to be well for me. That's very inspiring, considering that he has a story that driven him to pursue medicine as a parent. So, what's your definition of the concept of lifelong learning and why is it important to you? Uh, previously, we used to think that, you know, the, the teacher or the senior doctor is the master. But, as we progress, we realize that actually things change very fast. You know, as a, as a senior teacher, for example, I can share with the student my experiences. But that experience, that treatment, the treatment and the concept at that time may soon be outdated. So the teacher must continue to learn. And in fact, he probably learn from the student. So vice versa, learning life is a lifelong process between the student and the teacher and the patient and the doctor. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the idea of, 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 of life, lifelong learning. Uh, and this is especially true for medicine uh, and uh, in medical education. Right. So in terms of technology, since you have your computer, you have two phones, so do you think technology is a help or a threat to humanity? especially in your career or field? Okay, I think in a way we are blessed to have technological advances. So, so it can be a threat, it can be a threat, but I would take it as a help. I, I take it as a help. Uh, so I try to humanize, humanize the technology, if you understand what I mean. Uh, for example, we have this newest technology in AI called ChatGPT. So if I have a patient with a problem, 
For example, this patient got blood in the urine. I can I can ask ChatGPT what are the causes of blood in the urine, and they come up with like twenty causes. But I will have to humanize that to the patient I have in front of me because different patients, like a child with blood in the urine, a young girl with blood in the urine, and an older man with blood in the urine, the causes are different. But the technology at the moment is not humanized. So we, we have to look at what is good technology and humanize it and to use it for good benefit. According to the same principles I mentioned earlier, to bring happiness to people. Of course, you can use technology in another way and, and, and make use of it to commit criminal activities. Uh, for example, you can ask ChatGPT, how do I kill myself? And that, that can come up with all the list of things that you can do. Uh, so, so I think, I think technology is there to stay. Uh, it will carry on. It's, it's for us as human beings to humanize it and make the best use of it to help mankind rather than the other way around. So, since you have accomplished so many things, you have gone through so many things in life, and now that you have a well-established job, name a work accomplishment that makes you proud of who you are today. Well, that is a tough question. Uh, but I can think of a few things that I'm quite happy with. Uh, the first thing is, I think, I think and I hope, I brought happiness uh, to a lot of people and I have improved the health of many of my patients. Uh, in terms of, of uh, medical, so-called medical accomplishment in my career, uh, I think when I was in General Hospital Kuala Lumpur, I did about 100 kidney transplants, transplants and many of them are from Sarawak and uh, after 10, 20, even 30 years, the patients come back to, to see me. Uh, to say that they have done well all these years. So I think kidney transplantation uh, is, is a good part of my achievement. Although now we have problems now with that, that, that sector of our, our care in Malaysia because we don't have that many donors and we also don't have that many transplant surgeons and also the medical facilities uh, are being overcrowded uh, in Malaysia. The second group, the second type of uh, accomplishment that I have is uh, I have I have a big practice of pediatric urology. In other words, children with problems with the waterworks, with the urinary tract. So these children, I look after them when they are born, I look after them as they grow, I look after them when they are young adults, uh, and so, so they have improved in their life. So this, this field of pediatric urology is something that I am happy to have achieved, and many of them, of course, they are adults now, and I continue to motivate uh, young urologists to specialize in kidney transplantation and pediatric urology. Uh, and why do I mention this in particular in, in Malaysia? Is that these are the two fields, in particular pediatric urology, which is not covered by medical. So, with all the things that you have gone through, and all the accomplishments, and all the experiences in life, is there anything that you regret or have remorses of not doing earlier in your life? Well, uh, technology is one area that I think I could have done more uh, because I spent a lot of time teaching, I spent a lot of time talking to patients, I spent a lot of time writing medical reports for them. So I have less time to indulge in technology. People think that technology is something you can just pick up, uh, take a car and drive. No, actually technology also takes time. And now we, re we realize that minimally invasive surgery like laparoscopy, uh, robot, robotic uh, surgery in surgery is very important so this is one area that I have I seem to have neglected I did not spend enough time developing these uh, skills and not only the skills to make arrangements to get the hardware for example a WG robot now costs 15 million so that will require some, some special planning uh, with the authorities so this is one area that I wish I had spent more time I won't say regret, lah, no, but I wish I spend more time to develop this, this, this part of my practice and also uh, in Malaysia as well. Now that you have become a figure that people should look up to, what are the advice or life lessons you would give to the youngsters, like the young generation, the Gen Zs? Okay, I, I, I lecture at Unimas to the medical students regularly and almost at every lecture, uh, I tell them the following, because when you look at the students, 
they are young people, they are working hard, they are stressed. So I tell them the first thing in your life is to be happy. There is no point being unhappy and studying, looking after patients, and then you feel depressed. So first thing you must think of happiness. What makes you happy? If you play computer games an hour every day, if you're happy, by all means play the computer game. If you're like in Sarawak, you must have your kolomi every other day, go and take your kolomi. Or if you have laksa every Sunday, go and take your laksa. Uh, so you must be happy. Some people are happy with pets, with dogs. Some people are happy just sitting in the garden. Some people are happy with a swim. So first thing, you must be happy. Second thing is, of course, you must have a healthy body. Healthy body is physical body and mental body. So physical body, usually you need to look after your diet, you need to exercise, you need to maintain your body weight. And if you have any medical conditions, get it optimized. If you have a medical condition like high blood sugar, you know, high blood pressure, have it treated. Doesn't mean you must take medication, but have it controlled. Talk to your family, family partner or family doctor. And then, thirdly, then only you set about your goals in life. Uh, the other day I was giving a lecture with my son to the Unima students about SDL, self-directed learning. That means you have to set your goals, discuss with your, your mentors, and then you can direct, set your goals in your life for that semester or for that year. Then you can carry on to try to achieve your goals uh, with your mentor and also with your own initiative. You must take care of your own life. You must take charge of your own life. Uh, and of course, as you go about doing that, you must maintain your top integrity uh, and be, be honest to yourself as much as possible. If you set a goal that you think that you cannot achieve, then you have to change or give it more time, you know, give it more time to achieve that goal. Uh, you know, some people, they do their masters within one year, two years, or they do a PhD within three years, seven years. So you have to titrate and, and set your goals so that you can maintain a good, happy, healthy life. Now that we have come to the end of the session, thank you so much, Dr. Terence Lay, for sparing your time for us. And I hope that things that you have shared to us will benefit us in the future or even now. So thank you so much, Dr. Lay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm most happy to have any further discussion by WhatsApp or email. Uh, for as long as I can. Thank you so much. Thank you.